Let's turn to Austin Williams then, who is the author of China's Urban Revolution, Understanding Chinese Eco-Cities, as well as being a senior lecturer in the Department of Architecture at Kingston University. Austin Williams, uh, welcome to you. If there is a, a looming supply crunch for rare earth metals, it does seem that China saw it coming way before anyone else. Well, I mean, yes, obviously uh, we had uh, colonial exploits in the Congo uh, 150 years ago, uh, where um, Stanley and Livingston went there, and had they known that we were going to need uh, vehicles and iPads, they may have um, taken some of the rare earth rather than the rubber and the slaves and the, uh, you know, and the rest of the materials that they exploited. So, you know, if you have a if you have an ability to predict or look into the future or recognise where the where the trends are going, then uh, fair enough, we may have uh, had a different view on this. But obviously, China is, um, as as you saw on the pictures which you showed in your opening piece, uh, the Congo is still um, a third world country, as we used to call it, a developing country, and some of the exploitative conditions that uh, miners find themselves in in the Congo haven't really. Um, uh, br brought Congolese people to empathize particularly well with the Chinese mm. exploitation of their uh, country, let alone the way that the British Empire um, conducted themselves. So actually, just a, about a month or so ago, Congo was actually arguing that they wanted to renegotiate their uh -huh. deals uh, within lithium uh, mining with, with China. And as you say, as you said in your opening remarks, that allows us certain opportunities, I would hope, to really kind of start to step in and really um, see this as a trade opportunity and, a, and an ability to maybe, um, you know, put, us, put ourselves forward rather than just relying on China to, to, uh, to provide. Austin, what's, what's the modus operandi for the Chinese? I mean, what do they offer to Congo, for instance? Is it roads and railways? Is it cash to, to officials in high places? How do they work? Well, you know, it's all of the above, isn't it? I mean, obviously, it's an authoritarian state, China, therefore, um, you know, they don't really play by normal rules. However, one rule that they do play by is their notional understanding that they don't like to interfere in the uh, internal affairs of other countries. Now, you may think that that's an absurd statement, but effectively what they are doing is deals. So they are saying we will provide, as you say, infrastructure, which... British colonialism didn't provide over 200 years. China has done it within 30. And they will provide schools, roads, rail, infrastructure, you know, schools, nurseries, hospitals, whatever. Um, and they will then require payment for that. And uh, it's a straightforward, um, in, in some ways, capitalist deal, as they say, uh, with, with uh, Chinese characteristics. Um, so in some ways, a lot of people, uh, the, the, the advances and the development of infrastructure within um, some of these African nations has been quite remarkable in the last 30 years. And they've been thankful for it. Obviously, it, it does come to a point where they now begin to realize that in many instances, Chinese workers are being sent to um, handle the excavation and the higher, um, you know, the more professional status of some of these industries and African uh, locals are being left behind. Uh, and that's kind of changing the dynamic a little bit. There was a stage maybe 10 years ago when, our, you know, uh, China was very gleeful of the fact that they were turning their back on some of those kind of colonial or commonwealth relationships mm -hmm. that they've had over the years and are now having to look to China. But, you know, I mean, I, I think I go with the last uh, speaker, though. I think that the idea about, first of all, um, the, the dash for electric vehicles or even this arbitrary date of 2030 or 2025 or 2030, whichever is the most fashionable date provided by environmentalists these days, um, is an, is, I mean, it is arbitrary. And once you start kind of setting those kind of targets, as we know from Matt Hancock's kind of uh, career, um, then suddenly things fall by the wayside and we kind of are missing opportunities. And I think innovation in transport mobility. First of all, we have to recognize mobility is a good thing rather than a, something which we should reject. And secondly, if we are going to encourage mobility, then we're going to have to maybe start talking about innovative ways of achieving it. And if those innovations are constrained by the tunnel vision of just saying we should minimize carbon emissions, then we aren't really yeah. being innovative. I think innovation comes from a 360 degree vision yeah. of possibilities rather than just a kind of tunnel vision. Uh, just in terms of China's strategy, Austin, I mean, obviously, a lot of these rare earth metals it needs because it then refines them in China and turns them as the you know, factory of the world into goods it then subsequently exports. So it's got a domestic demand factor to look to. But there is also geopolitics, you presume, it knows, and it's, we presume it's going to play a sort of hybrid warfare approach to things. And it can say to countries, look, We've got, we've got you by the short and curlies. We, we've got the cobalt in the Congo sewn up. You need to play by our rules. 
That's true. In which case, you either then play by their rules and do some trade deals with China. Uh, and I think there may be a, an overstatement of the fear factor of China at the moment. I mean, who knows what may happen in the future. Um, but also, you can then maybe change the rules. And, and as I say, and, and as um, as Jake Berry kind of commented, maybe you start to invest in hydrogen fuel cells and start to develop your own um, arrangements, whether it's nuclear uh, powered or whether it's jet propulsion or wherever it might be. There are a million and one ways. Maybe I'm over exaggerating. There are a number of ways uh, that we can maybe go our own way. But China is definitely investing heavily in lithium. It's buying up Australian mines. It's buying up Chilean mines. You know, it's not just uh, finding it in on its own territory or in Africa. So, uh, and these are trade deals. I mean, Australia are no fools, right? And they are allies. They're part of the Commonwealth. Yeah. And yet they've done a deal by selling their lithium to China. So, you know, trade is trade, isn't it? Uh, it, it is. Trade is trade. Austin, I'm just reminded, not, not least by the picture over your shoulder there of, of French revolutionaries going about their revolutionary business, uh, and this being the 100th anniversary of the foundation of the Chinese Communist Party today. I wonder, as, as you tell that story about the Chinese going in and persuading the Congolese, for instance, that they are offering a radical alternative to those horrible British colonialist, colonialist, colonialists and imperialists who were here before. I wonder if that's part of their package of gentle persuasion. Look, we're in, out with the old, uh, in, with, in with the new, the communists, the revolutionaries. What say you? Well, there's an element of that. I mean, obviously, many of the countries that China is doing deals with in, in Africa, say, are some of those um, pariah states, which the West has not um, touched for a, for a long time, from Zimbabwe through to the Congo, as we say. Um, uh, but also, you have to remember that, you know, 1921, the foundation of the Chinese Communist Party emerged from uh, a vast imperial um, uh, 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 rule, which um, denied... Uh, many people, uh, their rights, obviously, as serfs, um, and also was backed up by the Americans and the British. So there was that, ex, you know, that re release. So there was a dynamic period. I mean, revolutions of that era were kind of, uh, dynamic moments, giving rise to what, what many Chinese uh, thought at the time was welcoming in democracy and wow. science. The Austin. fact that that got turned on its head uh, is a problem. Yeah, Austin Williams, really good to talk to you. Interesting long perspective there. A dynamic is one way of looking at the, the, the 100 million deaths of the, of the last century, isn't it, I suppose? But uh, <laughs> Austin Williams, very good to talk to you. Appreciate I wasn't your time. defending Thanks. that. No, I know, I know you weren't. Thanks a lot.